Welcome. Welcome to the Institute for Education Diplomacy. Welcome to Washington, D.C. And we're very, very happy to have you here with us. Um, as many of you know, education diplomacy is a, a fairly new venture, um, not only for ACEI, but a new venture altogether, which makes it actually incredibly uh, special. Um, we have had other diplomacy movements happening um, around the world from various sectors, but education did not have uh, such a diplomacy movement. So we're thrilled, and we hope this uh, is just the beginning um, of what will be continued dialogue um, and conceptualizing of how we move this concept forward. So thank you very much for being here, and again, thank you for traveling uh, over hills and through valleys and all the snow and ice um, that you did to be here with us. Again, I'm Diane Whitehead. I'm the Executive Director of the Association for Childhood Education International. We are based here in Washington, D.C., but we have members and supporters all over the world. So we are a truly international community. What we'd like to start with today is to bring forward our current president, the president of our board of directors. Her name is Dr. Carrie Whaley. Welcome. I wanted to tell you a little bit about ACEI for those of you that are new to us this year. We are, as Diane mentioned, an international nonprofit organization based here in Washington whose mission is to support the optimal education, development, and well being of children worldwide. And as Diane mentioned, we have work uh, through members and supporters around the world at this point. ACEI works to secure a human future for all and sees education as crucially important to achieving economic stability and a healthy, happy human race. We have worked together with the Alliance for Childhood, uh, leading an initiative now that's been going on for a few years called the Decade for Childhood, which began in 2012 um, to, to provide a platform for global conversations such as the ones that you'll be having today. Um, about childhood, best practices, and trying to provide a positive future for all children. As a part of that initiative, the Center for Education Diplomacy was founded by ACEI in 2009 when it first began to develop this concept of education diplomacy. And then the first institute was held in 2011 as a way to share important information and communicate ideas across our cultures and nations. This is important, for as the world becomes more globalized, it seems to us that education offers the ideal platform for ensuring that the next education is well-versed in critical topics for the future. And since both education and diplomacy are needed for the healthy development of individuals and societies, bringing them together gives us a dynamic and powerful tool for positively shaping our world. So the Center for Global Diplomacy provides platforms for meaningful voice within the international community on how education can contribute to the progress and prosperity of communities. And as we begin to focus now on the next uh, sustainable development agenda, those of my generation must ensure that we raise up those in the generations behind us so that the good work will continue long after us. And I'm so pleased to see some younger faces here because Mine is, is, is pushing towards retirement these days, and I want to know that we're leaving things in good hands. ACI is an ideal place for that to happen because we've always been a multi-generational association of educators who are committed to enhancing and shaping education for all people, for in, engaging our, our students and others that we come in contact with, um, trying to meet the needs of individuals and societies wherever we live. And isn't that the, the goal of all education diplomats in the end? So that's why I'm so excited to be here with all of you at this institute to celebrate the work that we've been engaged in, to make new friends, to reconnect with old ones. While we're here, we'll hear from an inspirational array of people and spend time dialoguing, networking, around new ideas and opportunities for, for diplomacy and for advocacy. I see a lot of connection between these concepts of diplomacy and advocacy because much of what education diplomats engage in is influencing decision makers for the benefits of others. 
Among other things, ACEI itself engages in various types of advocacy, whether at the UN level, the national level, or more locally, as each of us engages within our own spheres of influence. I'd like to share the stories of a few of our own ACEI education diplomats and some of the work that they've been engaged in lately. Less than four months after the 2012 earthquake quake in Haiti, the government gave permission for the schools to reopen and the need to transform the education system became more pressing. In January 2013, one of our board members, Ghislaine Richard, had the opportunity to visit a preschool in rural Pétionville built and managed by Haiti Partners, an agency that had been working in rural areas of Haiti on many projects, including the support for early and primary education. At the director of uh, health and teaching staff, Dr. Richard will be supporting the school with a course on basic edu uh, pre prevention, first aid, and CPR. So good work there in Haiti. Also, Hanan Baki, I don't think Hanan got to be with us today. She's um, our ACEI country liaison from Egypt. She's been working to facilitate access to undergraduate scholarships through Andy East, uh, MEPI, and American University in Cairo. Um, Baki has also been um, arranging training on ways to deal with traumatized children. Walking with Wounded Children is a program designed to equip adults working on a fundamental level to help emotionally wounded children. And it's a course that covers the basics of walking with wounded children, understanding and accessing the wounded child, uh, healing relationships, and active listening and tools for child counseling. So that's a course she's developing there in Egypt. Then last year in Nigeria, Esther Adwolowo, uh, I think Esther is with us too, right? Is she here right now? She's going to be here if she's not here at the moment. Um, she's our country liaison in Nigeria, and she served as the lead consultant for the development of early learning standards for all children from birth to age five. The document went before the National Education Council of Nigeria for approval, and they granted one year of compulsory early childhood education for five-year-old children in public primary schools. It was approved by the government and was implemented in September of 2013. Uh, then we'll move over to Nepal, where Vishnu Bhatti, is Vishnu here with us at the moment? Yes, thank you, Vishnu, for being here. <clears throat> He's the Director of Partners for Sustainable Development and our country liaison in Nepal. Uh, he worked together with a whole delegation of others from ACEI's International Outreach Committee to plan and implement a Nepal study tour in the month of January. After several educational site visits, which we heard at length about in our board meeting this morning, very exciting, uh, visits to public schools, private schools, and even an orphanage, the tour culminated with an early childhood um, education summit in Kathmandu, which included the ministry, major universities, uh, UNICEF, and other NGOs and INGOs. One of the most profound experiences of my position as ACI president is hearing stories like these from ACI members around the world who are passionate about our shared concern for children. As we work together, we're building a civil society, one that includes children who depend on our mercy and goodness. But to effectively engage in such work, we must be aware of global trends that impact communities and therefore have a direct and an indirect effect on our efforts. Education diplomacy becomes increasingly important in a world faced with con compelling statistics such as these. I did a little research to find out just how many children are in the world at the moment, and I got a variety of results depending on what site I was visiting, but it's around 2 billion children in the world today. Of those, 1.6 billion, which is more than half, have no electricity. One billion of those, which is around half, live in poverty, and I suspect the same billion suffer deprivation of at least one basic need, water, food, sanitation, something of that nature, and five million die each year from hunger and malnutrition. That really disturbs me. We're not talking about children who are sick or have diseases, just children who are hungry. 
of, um, of that two billion, somewhere between 143 and 210 million worldwide are orphans. So that's about one-tenth of that population. Child labor affects 150 million. 67 million school-aged children don't attend school. 22 million children are refugees. Two million, mostly who are girls, are sexually exploited each year. And of those, 1.2 million are trafficked. But I think the one that um, I find the most disturbing is that 22,000 children under the age of five die every single day. So between while we're here today and when we leave Sunday, that's 88,000 children. So we've done a lot. You know, the, the, the statistics are improving over the last 20 years, but there's still much to be done. And any time you hear statistics like these, they're tough to process, aren't they? We think, wow, we've come so far, and yet there's still all this work to be done. Perhaps they're even depressing. Doing work that involves working on behalf of others and representing those who can't stand up for themselves can be exhausting and at times even disheartening. Yet each one of us can choose to be a bystander or a participant when issues affecting children come to light. And it's heartening that so many of our ACI members and supporters choose to intervene and do something about the grave moral problems that they in encounter. So I'd like to leave you with a word of encouragement today from one of my favorite authors. Every four or five years, I uh, spend the holidays rereading J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. It's been a favorite of mine for many years now. This was the year for the rereading. <clears throat> so I was immersed in Middle Earth for the entire month of January and then spent several snow days last month uh, rewatching all of the movies again just to make sure I hadn't missed anything. If you're familiar with the series, you know that the story involves various species inhabiting Middle Earth who are engaged in an apocalyptic battle of good versus evil. The only hope for the battle to be won is for a ring that threatens the future of the world to be destroyed, and it has fallen to the young hobbit Frodo Baggins to complete this formidable task. And isn't it uh, no surprise that we commit such a task to someone so young? So Frodo sets out on an arduous journey, <clears throat> hoping to rid Middle-earth of evil. What a quest for him and his friends. At one point during his seemingly hopeless struggle, Frodo is feeling pretty overwhelmed with the enormity of what he's undertaken. Probably much like you may feel when you hear facing st stats like the ones I've just shared. And he's talking to the wise wizard Gandalf about it. <coughs> Excuse me, he says sorrowfully to Gandalf, I wish the ring had never come to me. And Gandalf replies, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is, to, what to do with the time that is given to us. For the fate of the outcome, you're not answerable, but only for the doing of your own task. I began to, to consider the similarities of Frodo's struggles to destroy the ring of evil and to our struggles to eliminate the various evils of our day. Like Frodo, each of us is only responsible for the time and task that is given to us. Different ones of you will bear different levels of responsibility in that task, some great and some small. Some of you may be able to devote more time to a task and some more money and some more effort than others are. But the good news is, is that each of you is only responsible for the task that's given to you. I don't have to do your task and you don't have to do mine. And as the elven queen Galadriel assured Frodo, even the smallest person can change the course of the future. So however you choose to be involved, you have my thanks and admiration, and you help to drive the changes we all hope to see for, for the future in our lifetime. And as the elves say, may the star shine upon the end of your road. Thanks for being here. The world has known for centuries that education was vital to the development of the individual, that education could change lives. 
Education provided people with a pathway to gaining professional skills, seeking higher paying jobs, and enjoying more personal life fulfillment through the acquisition of knowledge. What the world didn't understand for some time was that education not only was a force that could change the lives of individuals, but it actually possessed something quite astonishing, a transformative power to change communities, nations, and our whole world. For much of the 20th century, um, we looked at education through a more focused lens. We were examining local and national education practices, policies, curriculum, and assessment. Um, but then we uh, shifted as well over to sort of comparative education. And that was the method by which we learned about education in other nations, comparing and contrasting education systems, practices internationally. There was no cohesive concept of education as a force for positive global change and no expanded vision of learning. Our understanding of the deeper power of education as a global force began to really take shape in 1990 with the World Conference on Education for, whole, for All, which was held in Jantim, Thailand. Since the Jantim Conference, major global education meetings have taken place that have furthered our understanding of education's transformative elements and the goals that we must meet in order to realize the true power of education. During the last 25 years, a global education movement has evolved, which in many ways began with that first world conference on education for all in 1990. At the second world conference on education, uh, held in Dakar, Senegal in 2000, and we actually have a member of ACEI who attended that world conference and had input um, into that, and Nancy Brown, I think, is sitting right back here. Raise your hand, Nancy, there you go. Okay, <laughs> so that's quite something, and we're very proud to, um, uh, to have had representation um, at that conference. Um, and that's really where um, EFA uh, was in some ways born, uh, because that's where these three objectives of access, quality to education, and equity in education um, were really began to take shape. There were six EFA goals developed in 2000 that aligned with these three objectives, objectives with a target date to be achieved by this year, 2015. In 2000, the same year as the EFA goals were developed, the United Nations created the Millennium Development Goals. These goals were designed to forward international development in many areas, health, poverty, child mortality, and environmental sustainability. Um, the MDG goals, particularly goal two, are worked in tandem with the six EFA goals. And you can see that even though both MDGs and EFA have had many successes along the way, um, we, still have a, we still have a ways to go. And so that sort of analysis at looking at what we have achieved and what we have left to do is part now of what we call this post-2015, the date that they were due to be achieved by, post-2015 um, sustainable development uh, goals, sort of the post-2015 agenda. How are we going to shape these sustainable development goals? What was achieved and what wasn't? Successive meetings on education have been held throughout the last 15 years. Since 2000, there's been an energetic global dialogue on education that has led to new ways of exchanging information, taking action on education worldwide. In 2013, the United Nations Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, launched the Education First Initiative. This initiative was really to support progress towards the global education goals. New conferences, new platforms, and reconfigured initiatives for sharing new universal visions of education have been created. For example, one such vehicle designed to advance education uh, is the Global Partnership for Education, GPE as it is known, began as the first track initiative, or FTI, which was largely a funding mechanism to forward the EFA goals. GPA has even evolved, evolved itself in, in, into an initiative galvanizing and coordinating a global effort to deliver good quality education to all children, prioritizing the poorest and the most vulnerable first. The vision of GPE is quite simple, a good quality education for all children everywhere so they fulfill their potential and contribute to societies. 
Although GPA's main focus has been really as this funding mechanism for global education, its scope of work has changed. Um, it has evolved. Uh, and they really are trying to ensure, um, and having lots of dialogue about this, that children remain at the center of what is happening with that global uh, uh, sort of funding approach. So there's quite heated debate happening at GPE uh, board meetings around how they maintain their central focus on children. Today we have many new actors entering the international stage of education. There's emerged a global transnational civil, civil society made up of non-governmental organizations that are particularly active in the education sector. There's also been an emergence of private organizations heavily invested in education from small profit companies to large corporations integrating themselves, integrating themselves into the education sector in various ways, building and operating schools, designing and selling curriculums and education materials and offering professional development trainings and holding their own education meetings and events around the world. The emergence of these new actors has created a new global architecture for education. What used to be mostly the purview of national and local government has now entered a complex era where a variety of actors are sharing ever increasing portions of, of the development and the delivery of education. But how does this so-called new global architecture of education change the forecast for appropriately and sensitively uh, uh, education to be developed and those opportunities to be expanded. Certainly there's been much added value to education on the one hand with new actors sharing the responsibility and vision for expanding learning opportunities worldwide. On the other hand there are concerns to overcome. There are critical questions about how these new actors um, must, must answer questions to ensure that opportunities for education are supported and challenges to education are not exacerbated. For example, one question being pondered today is how does the privatization of education shift the balance of responsibility and accountability of national governments as education providers? How do new actors engage and impact the global governance of education? What is the global governance of education mean? To some, this phrase may sound a bit worrying. Global governance is not global government. There is no world order, we hope, <laughs> being secretly designed to implement a one-size-fits-all approach to education. Global governance really involves the political integration of transnational actors aimed at negotiating responses to problems that affect more than one uh, state or region of the world. Global governance involves cooperative problem-solving arrangements. Many of these arrangements tr traditionally took place within the UN system and its network of agencies and national governments. But today, global governance issues may also involve what we call non-state actors as well, non-national uh, government actors as well. The landscape of education is becoming increasingly more complex and multifaceted with more players on the field at a time when the transformative power of education is being recognized more and more. For example, the Muscat Agreement that was created last year at a UNESCO conference in Amman, Jordan, called for education to be at the very center of the global development agenda. This year's UNESCO report, the so-called Global Monitoring Report for Education for All, remember we talked about education for all and the six goals um, that they were trying to achieve through 2015. Uh, and this report is called Sustainable Development Begins with Education. And they actually released a supplemental report titled Education Transforms Lives. So we can see just how education is positively impacting our world. Um, not just uh, uh, education in the sense that many of us have thought of it um, for, for many years. This is an encouraging sign that education is finally being recognized as the platform from which all other sectors emerge, grow, and innovate. But at the same time, it's an overwhelming responsibility for those of us working in the education sector. Education is being realized as the key to global health, social well-being, economic security, global security. 
In 2015, the world will come together again to write a new set of international development goals, replacing the former Millennium Development Goals. These new goals have been named the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which we've talked about. And the design of these goals and their subsequent results will have enormous implications for the future of humanity. How do we sustain the progress that we've made in the development of our world? How do we look to new innovations and sectors to sustain our human future? This is where education diplomacy fits into the picture. In 2009, the Association for Childhood Education International embarked on a new journey. With all the complexities of education today, ACEI took the lead to develop a new approach to international dialogue and exchange. ACI looked at new diplomatic movements emanating from other sectors and recognized that the way forward was to develop a diplomacy model for education, to advance global interactions around education that would lead to innovative and sustainable solutions. This new approach, again called education diplomacy, um, we hope will be a way of collaborating and will help those involved with education everywhere to make better connections to each other find areas of mutual agreement and create lasting partnerships to build and expand education access, equity, quality, and we actually add in sustainability with that as well. Community to community, nation to nation. Global education should not be about producing a one-size-fits-all global form of education. One of the key underlying principles of education diplomacy is in fact to ensure that all education experiences are contextualized for the needs of individuals, communities, and countries. Lastly, I think I'm lastly, Yvette's actually helping me with that. I'd like to show you four images. These images are similar to those that we may see on the news in most of our nations. Um, the interesting thing about these images is they're not images of people involved in major wars or conflict. These are images of people fighting for the right to education. As educators and those invested in educators, education success, we are the guardians of what now has become a global commodity, and I use that word sensitively, that's so highly valued that people are willing to protest and in some cases risk their lives for it. The pictures you're seeing now are pictures of parents. Um, I think there's a picture of a child in there, um, pictures of students, pictures of community members fighting for that right to education. Yes, indeed, it's now essential that we create new diplomatic approaches, not only to solve the ordinary systemic challenges of education, of which we know there are many, but to resolve the urgent issues of education as well. There's no doubt that we are at a critical crossroads with dangerous intersection ahead of us of supply and demand issues for education and all sorts of other uh, global intersections of urgent issues. We hope that you are as excited as we are about the possibilities for this new movement of education diplomacy. You're at the beginning of something. And it's important that I think for anybody who's at the beginning of any true, true movement that's going to help to change conversation, that we take that responsibility seriously. Think about how we can get involved in this new movement together. We look forward again to learning from you and sharing with you at this institute. And we very, very, very much thank you for being here. Okay.